Good morning and welcome to uh, our organ Zoom this morning. <laughs> Happy New Year, everyone. As we begin the season of Advent today, it's the perfect time to greet you with Happy New Year. Our new liturgical year begins with the Advent season of hope, expectation, and preparation for the birth of Jesus and for his second coming. The hymn, Wake Awake for Night is Flying, is a powerful hymn that responds to this wake-up call that Christ is coming. In our scripture lessons today, both the Apostle Paul and Jesus challenge us to wake from sleep, for we know neither the day nor the hour of the Lord's coming. As we watch for the promised day of salvation, we wait for what we already have. Christ comes among us this day as word and meal that strengthens our faith in the promises of God. Philip Nikolai, the son of a Lutheran pastor, is the writer of both the text and tune of two monuments of German hymnody, the hymn you are about to hear, Wake Awake for Night is Flying, and O Morning Star, How Fair and Bright. Wackedauf, or Wake Awake, is known as the King of Chorales, while O Morning Star is known as the Queen of Chorales. The King of Chorales, Wackedauf, is based on a story from Matthew 25 of the wise and foolish virgins that we read in worship just a few weeks ago. Yes, Bach based on this by Nikolai. Bach also rearranged the music of this cantata for the organ. Marilyn Collier will sing the first verse of Wake Awake for Night is Flying. And then after Bruce has a few words about the organ, I will play the chorale that Bach arranged from Cantata 140. Okay, I hope that came across okay. We're gonna be doing some things this morning that are gonna tax our technological abilities, I think, to the limit. Um, so hopefully it'll all work. If we happen to, in moving the camera at some point, unplug something and the uh, meeting goes dead, just join back up in a minute. We'll get it back on as soon as we can. I'll try not to do that, but um, it is possible. We're, we also have to uh, switch at one point. Sherry's going to play the organ live a little bit, and the organ sound doesn't come across Zoom very well on the computer's microphone. So we have an external microphone to plug in, so you may hear some fumbling around when that's going on. Um, the other disclaimer is that the 
cold in here this morning. It's 55 degrees in here. We opted not to turn the heat on because it takes a while for it to come up and it takes even longer for the organ to get back up to temperature and it would be out of tune more than it is now. So there's just maybe a little bit of out of tuneness uh, at this cold temperature. We keep rubbing our hands together so we can stay warm. <laughs> so to talk a little bit about the, um, the new organ, um, here it is. Uh, let's see, where was I gonna play? Oh, okay. It has 494 pipes, um, 18 of which are silent. These little pipes that are in the lower two flats here don't play, but all the rest of them do. And that's a lot more than we had in the other organ. Only the center pipes of the other organ played. Uh, that has a lot of ramifications for how the this particular set of pipes sound in the room. It, it projects better, uh, is more enveloping, fills up the space a lot more than the other one. Um, let me show real quick a picture. We built three of these at the same time. Um, this is the three of them in the workshop. Ours is on the left in the Douglas fir case. The one just past it is a mahogany case and that went to a home in New Jersey. They have a, a music room. They're both organ professors and they uh, have a music room that's probably volume wise about the same size as our sanctuary. So it's not a small room <laughs> that that goes into. And the one on the far wall, the walnut one will be leaving uh, the week after this coming week to go to its new home in uh, the chapel at Wesley Homes up near SeaTac uh, Airport in Des Moines. Oops. I thought I would start off, actually I should have left the screen on share, and show you a quick uh, time-lapse video of our former organ being taken apart. I refer to it as former organ rather than old organ. It's only 10 years old and in terms of organs that's an adolescent at least <laughs> or maybe probably still a toddler actually. So so this is rather amusing. This took place over from about 8 in the morning till 2 or 3 in the afternoon all in one day. So this is a one minute time lapse. No sound. The frames were taken about every 40 seconds. They're wrapping the facade pipes in plastic for trans, uh, transferring it uh, into uh, pipe trays to keep them from getting scratched up. They're wrapping them up in, on the floor, which I thought was funny. So it comes flying apart when you do it like this. They went the last piece, so <laughs> kind of fun. Stop share. So um, one of the biggest differences stop-wise between this organ and the previous one is the inclusion of a reed stop. Uh, it's a whole set of pipes, 58 pipes, that have vibrating reeds that produce their tone. We didn't have any of those in the other organ. It's somewhat an imitative stop. It's called Dulcian 8, and it's patterned after, um, well, its sound sort of resembles the Renaissance reed instruments, a uh, wind instrument of the same name. So Sherry's going to play um, the famous Bach, Bach et Alf Chorale, um, using the reed as the solo stop in the tenor. So this is where I have to plug in the other microphone, and we'll see if this works. I hope it will. I will get out of the picture and she can play. 
Shall we test it and see if it's... I think it is. Okay. Plugging the mic again. So let's see. Since we saw a little bit ago the former organ uh, being disassembled, let's see a video of this organ being assembled. The same sort of thing, a time lapse. This was over a couple of days.
there's a skip in the middle of it. There was one part that we thought we had the um, phone recording and it wasn't. So the uppercase jumps up here all of a sudden without anything in between, but the rest of it all works like that. <laughs> Start to, oh, the sun sweeping across the floor and up the wall is kind of cool. See all the facade pipes going in? <laughs> That's mostly together. Um, we didn't quite have everything, but uh, you get the idea. Stop the share again. So, I've got to remember to look in the proper camera here, just like on TV. So we'll talk a little bit about the various parts of the organ now. The first thing you'll notice is the case is a little bit larger than the one we had before. It's 14 inches taller, about nine and a half inches wider. It's uh, six or eight inches deeper, the actual case, and then it, we pulled it a little bit farther away from the wall so we'll be able to get behind it to do maintenance work. At least the thin people can, not me. But um, that'll make it easier to work on later. Uh, that's the largest part of the difference physically. We, um, the carvings above the pipes serve several different functions. They're pretty for one thing and they also serve to kind of break up and disperse the sound out into the room because of all their different uh, shapes. The sound that hits that and gets diffused in, into the room in a nice way. So in this organ, because it was built for us, we were able to ask for some specific things to be included. We had a, a Lamb of God, the Agnus Dei, carved into the center tower up here at the top, and then some liturgical symbols as well. Over here on the left, we have a chalice and grapes. Uh, and these little flats in between, there's some little pod-like things and some tendrils from grape uh, vines. In the center next to the Agnus Day on both sides are sheaves of wheat and grapes. Again, symbols of the uh, uh, Lord's Supper. And on the far right, a basket of loaves and grapes. The basket of loaves, again, uh, referring to communion and also to the feeding of the 5,000. So some nice little uh, symbolism in it. A, a friend of mine, where I used to work in Virginia, d designed the carvings, and they were carved by a fellow who's done carving for us in Massachusetts. We like the way they turned out very much. Um, I mentioned the facade pipes earlier. These um, play in the facade from the D in the tenor octave here. That's this pipe over here. Up to the B in the upper octave, which is the little pipe up here on the, on the left. So this, as I said before, the principal A, as this stop is called, is the foundation of any organ. We even in a small organ like this, we try to make the, uh, the principal pipes, especially the eight foot, be uh, full, enveloping. Uh, by having so much of it in the facade, it projects really, really well into the room. Gives a, an immediacy of sound. Um, having all of these in the facade too gives it a little bit of a special sound. This is, is that set of pipes by itself. sound than we had in the other organ. The scale of these pipes is larger. It's, it's um, the diameters relative to each other are larger and more appropriate to this room. The former organ was really designed for small practice rooms or a house situation where you don't really want that kind of envelopment when you're sitting right in front of it for hours practicing. So this is a different thing where it's going to support congregational singing and this will do uh, a much better job than the other one. The other one was fine, but this is a different kind of sound. 
Um, just by comparison, that dulcian that I mentioned before, uh, to hear it by itself too, this is uh, using it instead of a, as a solo, as a chorus kind of sound. <laughs> other manual we have a Gadact 8, a flute sound, and this isn't so much different than what was in the former organ other than the fact that these pipes also are scaled a little bit larger. We have a four foot flute that's very much like the other one as well. principle is the basis of what we call a principal chorus. A large organ would have many more stops of principal pipes that are built up on top of this eight-foot principle and forming a chorus. In any one of these principal pipes there there's a fundamental tone and then there are lots of harmonics above it. So to listen to this there's both fundamental tune, the eight foot, that pitch, there's an octave above it, there's a fifth above that, all of that, all of that's a component of this sound, uh, an octave above the, two octaves above the fundamental. So on and so on. So you have these this harmonic series that's present in any of these pipes. We can build on that using the different pipes in the stop list too. The eight foot principle again is just the fundamental pitch at eight foot. It's the same pitch as a piano. So. We can add to that an octave above it. So the forfeit stop, which is an octave higher. And there's a two foot that's an octave higher than that. So in this organ that forms kind of a mini principal chorus, eight, four, and two, we can add to that the dulcian. Dulcian can also be used, as I did before, by itself. And add the forefoot to that. The two foot even to that. And even the eight foot again. You could play the two eight foots alone too, the principal eight and the dulcian. The same works on the other keyboard as well. We have the eight foot gadact, and we already heard the four foot with that. The same octave four that's on the lower keyboard is available on this organ on the upper keyboard. So we can hear the eight and four flutes together. Instead of the flute, the octave four. This makes possible some different accompaniment possibilities than were possible on the other organ. There's also a two and two thirds foot, which if we play a note on the Gadact, it plays this pitch. So you get this with the four foot flute. This further has another possibility 
this stop can be pulled halfway out. There's a little detent here. When it does that, it adds, let me do this again. You get this pitch and the third above that. So we get, I should have done it an octave higher so you could hear it better. This pitch. Some nice solo combinations possible there. The other main difference in the organ too is the the Subas 16 that we had before that are really low sounding pipes. I don't know if you could even hear this on your devices. It's kind of the subwoofer sound. This also has the possibility on this organ of being played an octave higher. So it has a, an eight foot extension to it. Without and with. That. Oh, okay. Um, so that's the, the basic sounds of the organ. I'm going to have to keep moving or I'm going to run out of time here. Uh, the keyboards on this organ are mechanically connected to the valves inside the wind chest that um, let the air into the pipes. So when you push a key down, you're physically opening that valve. <laughs> You can control that a little bit, uh, the player. That's a, a part of the mechanical key action. It's also, because it's a direct uh, connection, there's no electrical parts involved. There's really very little of anything to go wrong with an organ like this over a long period of time. Eventually the bellows that's down in the base of the organ will have to have its leather redone. Uh, but uh, other than that, most, uh, most everything doesn't need much uh, adjustment. The former organ here was here for almost 10 years and I didn't really do anything to it maintenance wise during that whole time. And I expect that this will be very much the same. Let's go around the side and look inside the organ briefly. Actually, before we do that, let's see, somewhere in here I wanted to play another video. I don't remember what it was. No, I guess not. We'll go over here. Sherry will move to the organ has a light inside to be able to work inside as well. So these running across here in rows of three are the various stops of the organ. This is the stopped flute, the Gedeck 8 of the upper manual. And you can see these are pipes, lead pipes that have a lid soldered on them. That effectively makes the pipe twice as long as it is. The wavelength is doubled. It goes up, turns around, and comes back down, and comes out the mouth. So these are eight foot pipes, even though the longest pipe over at the other side is only four feet long. Right next to it is the four foot flute. The midsection of it has these little chimneys on top of it. So this pipe is partially stopped and partially open. The chimney gives a very interesting sound to the, or very interesting overtone series to the sound. Um, it has a almost a German umlaut in its sound, a kind of ur sound. Uh, next to that, you can't tell very much, but over down in the bass, especially these are the two and two thirds of the nazat, so it's a little bit longer than the forefoot. Um, these are open and tapered. They're also flute pipes, and next to it is that little half draw stop, the tierce one and three fifths. This is the octave four, the principal pipes that are an octave higher than the uh, facade pipes at eight foot. The next thing is the reed, the dulcian. I might dare to maybe take one of these out and show you what a reed looks like. You can see this up close. 
This is rather much like a clarinet mouthpiece down here, and there's a little vibrating brass reed that sits against it. If I suck through it here, air goes up through, and the reed has a little bit of a curvature to it. So as air goes under it, it creates a little bit of a vacuum, which sucks the reed tongue down against the, the mouthpiece, the shallot. And the, then once it closes, the spring of the reed pops it open again, and then the air pressure goes through, and it, it uh, pulls it down again. So this happens very quickly on these small pipes. This wire that extends down to the bottom can slide up and down and can tune the tongue uh, so we can, that's the way these pipes are actually tuned. But the vibrating length of the reed and the resonator length are closely coupled on this stop so it stays uh, very much in tune. This is in a reed stop very much like the Gedeck pipes are to the flue pipes in that its, own, its longest pipe is only four feet long, but it plays eight foot pitch. Let's see if I can put this back in without knocking it out of tune. That's probably pretty good. So next to it is the octave two, and a few of the uh, facade pipes that where it stops being in the facade and comes inside the trebles are right here in the front. This, what it's sitting on here is the wind chest of the organ. This is the heart of the whole instrument. Everything connects to the wind chest. The pipes sit on it. The stop action connects in here. I'll talk about that in a second. The valves, the, the keys are connected to the, the lower keys are connected to valves in here and the upper keys are connected to valves back here. Uh, the wind system comes in and provides wind pressure inside that pallet box where the valves are. Whenever a key is depressed, a valve is pulled open. All of the pipes that can play from that key stand above a channel up in this part of the wind chest that runs front to back. Um, it's actually the, the lower keyboard's channel is this long and the upper keyboard's channel is this long in here. There's a divider in the middle. It's actually right in here. This, stop, this is the stop that plays on both keyboards. So it has a slider, the stop action on both uh, sets of stop action. What's going on with the sliders? These are connected to the, to the stop knobs. When it slides one way, a hole opens. This is a big version of it. And when you slide it the other way, when you push the stop knob in, you block the wind off. So this is a mechanical switch that lets the air either through to the set of pipes or not. If you draw the stop um, out, it slides in, the holes all line up with the pipes and the channel below. And if you slide it the other way, it stops it. So it's a very simple, trouble-free mechanism. Talking about the pipes a little bit themselves too, we mentioned already that there are three different kinds of flutes in this organ, the stopped flute, the chimney flute, and the open tapered flutes. Oh, there are some wooden pipes you can see up above in the ceiling. And then these are the, some of the small pipes from the, uh, the pedal uh, board in eight that are tubed up here. The chest for the pedal is down behind the organ in the back. How are we doing for time, right? Okay. Um, one of the big differences, too, in this organ from the previous organ is that in the past five or six years, we've started to do some camera moving here again. Oops. We've begun casting our pipes, the metal, um, on sand, on a bed of sand. This is an ancient practice. Organ builders used to do that up through the probably 17th century into the 18th century, and then they started casting their metal on stone tables that had cloth on them. Uh, initially, that was kind of hard to do because the cloth would tend to uh, char or even melt or burn with the high temperature of the lead that had to be cast on it which is why they used to do the sand. The sand is more labor intensive to do, but it does some interesting things to the sound. I want to show you first a couple of videos here in the shop. We have a, a video of casting metal on 
a stone-covered cloth table, or a, a cloth-covered stone table, excuse me. This is an old video. This was uh, casting metal for a, an organ that we were restoring, a 200-year-old organ. There's a big uh, exhaust fan running in the background. Now, if you notice, as Eric pushes the box down the table, the metal is very shiny. It escapes the box at the back and forms a thin layer on top of the cloth. You'll notice as, right now it's starting to get cloudy. It's freezing very slowly, and spots appear on it. These spots are kind of a grain boundary between the lead and tin uh, molecules and a, about a 45% uh, tin alloy. We don't use this very much. We were matching the material that was in the old organ in this case, but it's, it's demonstrative of the very slow um, freezing process of the, of the metal when you cast it on stone. By comparison, this is a more modern, up-to-date um, video of the guys casting on sand. This bed of sand has been packed down in between those rails. The box slides down the same as before. They melt the, um, melt the material in a pot that's over here behind Ben. He's ladled it into this holding pot. They wait for it to reach a certain temperature, pour it into the uh, box, and then push it down the table. You'll notice this is really quick. Um, the metal freezes almost immediately behind the table. See it cloud over? It's shiny right behind the box and then freezes immediately. This is akin to, I'll play that one again because that one was so quick. You might want to see that again. Um, this is like what we do today with flash freezing vegetables. If you do that, the flash freezing doesn't destroy the cell structure of the vegetables and the um, the flavors maintained. Well, in the pipe metal, it's the same way. By freezing it very, very quickly, the grain structure um, is much, much finer. And it seems to, um, that seems to uh, do some things that promotes the speech of the pipes. They, they speak better, they, they have less extraneous noise in the sound, and they, um, they just work better. Paul and I had some experience with sandcast pipes several years ago when we both worked in Europe with the Flentrop company on a reconstruction they had done of a big organ in Hamburg. And we came home thinking that this was something that we should try in spite of the fact that it seemed to be a whole lot more work to do. And we've been very happy with the results. I think the way this organ sounds is due in part to the, um, the structure of the sandcast metal too. This whole demo today is a poor excuse for hearing all of this in person, and we'll look forward to doing this again sometime when we, uh, when we can all be, be together again. The other thing that I wanted to share with you, um, and we'll leave a little time at the end for, um, for some uh, questions, uh, I did a small demo in my home shop of voicing a pipe. People ask what voicing is and what tuning is. So you'll get to see both on this. It's about 10 minutes long, but it, you, you can see the whole process and kind of what's involved with, um, with voicing a pipe. Uh, and then you can get a little better grasp of uh, what that means for um, doing that for an organ that has 5,000 pipes in it. So here we go. Hi, I thought it would be interesting to show you what's involved in pipe voicing. I've set up this little uh, portable voicing setup in my home shop uh, that I built back when we started our COVID isolation back in March so I could do a little bit of work at home. It's a, basically a, an organ without a keyboard. There's a little electric blower down here that provides the wind. There's a blower or a bellows that regulates the wind with this brick on top of it and a little regulating valve. And if, if I play notes, you can see it move and the blower replaces the air that gets used, just like in the big organ. Then there's a little wind chest up here with just three notes on it that are played by these buttons. And I can set pipes in different rows on here and unblock the rows of pipes that I want to use. So this has got one pipe in it right now that I've already voiced. Um, 
I have some pipes here, some of the smaller ones in the next organ that we're building for a, a chapel of a uh, university or college in Michigan. These are the most typical pipes we have in the organ. Um, it's an open cylindrical metal set of pipes. Um, they're called principal pipes and they make the kind of sound that is related to the organ. It's not imitative of any orchestral instrument. This is organ sound that these make. So when we get them from the pipe makers, they don't make any noise. The mouth has been rough opened here, but it doesn't play. If I blow in it, it just makes some strange overtones. The pipes themselves are made of a lead tin alloy. This particular pipe is out of the high lead content that we use. Um, there are three pieces to this pipe. There's a, a body, a cylindrical body, a tapered foot, and in between the foot and the body is a little metal plate that's soldered in here that leaves a small flue way where the air goes through, and that's where we do the voicing. Um, so this is all soldered together in the shop and this is basically the way I get it as one of the voicers at the shop and it's my job to make music out of these things. So the first thing we do is mark how high this opening is going to be and I use a set of proportional dividers for that. This is a one half foot pipe so I, we have a four to one ratio on our proportion here and that just makes it easier to mark the pipes. So set it on the lower lip and scribe a line across the, the body, the upper lip where I want to cut to. So that's how high an opening the pipe is going to have. And I know I have made this chart from sample voicing that I've done at the shop. Now to do the actual work on the pipe, I'm going to put some magnifiers on my glasses so I can get in here a little bit closer and see what I'm doing. But the metal cuts quite easily. It's basically like solder. So this knife just slices it away. Just make several cuts and then get the pieces to fall out. I'm going to cut right up to that line eventually. This is probably the most painstaking part of the work in many respects is to get this done without damaging the pipe or cutting yourself. <laughs> You might think that uh, these small pipes, there aren't very many in the organ, but there actually are quite a few of them in, the, in a good sized organ. Maybe 40% uh, of the pipes in the organ are smaller than one and a half feet in length. The length being the, the speaking part of the pipe up here at the top. That's where I mentioned that this is a half foot pipe. This is six inches long. And the pipes are made slightly long of what we need it to be to play the pitch that we end up wanting out of the pipe at the end. So we simply start with it long and then start trimming its length until we get to the pitch we want. So there's the cut up where it should be. I'm going to straighten the upper lip out a little bit here. The corners are tucked in just a tiny little bit. I'm going to make one final cut on it here that will do a tiny little bit of a bevel on the upper lip that isn't much of anything. but just makes it work a little bit better. So there's the pipe is ready to be voiced. I have just a little bit of extraneous material here on the edges that I'm going to cut away as well. So... The next thing I do on these particular pipes is to blunt the front end of that languid just slightly with this crosshatch file that I've made. It looks like this. It's just a piece of brass with some knife cuts in it. And that makes the, um, the front edge of the languid um, a little more diffuse and causes the wind to go through the pipe in a better way. It actually kind of abrades the edge of the languid and makes some little tiny grooves in the front of it. I'm going to kind of straighten up the 
wind way here just a little bit. So this still probably doesn't play. It starts to make a little bit of noise, but that's an octave higher than it should be playing. So I'm going to put it in the hole here on the voicing chest. And that languid plate that's in between the body and the foot can be deflected downward slightly. I'm going to tap this down just a little bit and bend it just a little bit so it goes down closer to the foot. That changes where the wind sheet goes when it goes through the pipe. It'll probably play now. It actually does rather well. So I give it more wind blowing through it, and I want to hear it overblow its octave and then slide back down to the fundamental pitch again, and it won't quite do that yet. So we would say this is a little bit slow still. So give it another tap. Now it blo overblows its octave, which is what I want. So I'll play it again. This is a C. So I'm going to set my tuner here to C, and we'll watch that the pipe is 7.8 millimeters. So now comes the tuning part. The, the tuner is preset to the pitch that I want based on the um, temperature here in my shop right now, which is a little cool. It's 67 degrees. So I made a mark 7 millimeters. I'm not going to cut off quite all of it the first pass. So I'm going to cut that 7 millimeters off now. And that can be done too with these um, scissor-like shears. The top gets a little bit deformed sometimes when you do that, so you can straighten it back up with our cones. Now you can probably tell the pitch went up a little bit. Standing nearly still and it started to go more in the flat direction as I held it. That's only 0.6 millimeters too long. And it's actually a little bit longer than that, but I'll cut that off right now. Um, my handling the pipe makes the air inside of it warm. And so the pitch actually goes up when you've been handling it a lot. So to get to final pitch, this pipe would have to sit here for a couple of minutes and cool off. But for our purposes right now, I'll just take off the six tenths of a millimeter and you'll see that. still just a little bit flat, but that's working pretty well now. I voiced this one earlier, and it sounds pretty much the same. So that's all I would do at this point, and when it gets in the organ, we could refine that sound a little bit more if we wanted to. Uh, in some cases, this is as far as it would go, but we might do a little bit of loudening and softening of the uh, actual volume level of it by opening or closing this wind way a little bit when we actually get to the church or chapel or wherever to uh, to finish the organ. So that's what happens uh, in an organ like ours. That happened several hundred times on all, all the 490 some pipes that are in the organ. In a big organ that happens thousands of times in each organ and we do it several times. This is the initial voicing and tuning then it'll happen again when we end up at the installation. So that gives you a little bit of an idea what's involved. So I hope you enjoyed that. That's mostly what I have. I could talk a little bit more about things, but um, I thought I would stop and see if anybody had questions at this point or wanted to make comments about anything that you've seen. I hope you hit the record button on this, Bruce. I did, actually, yes. <laughs> I'd love to share this with the organist over at the American Church in Paris. Sure. He that would, would, he would really nice. enjoy that. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I hope so. So. Hey, Bruce. Yes. I got a question for you. Seeing you handle uh, lead like that uh, without gloves on, do you, do you have any concern about the lead, lead poisoning with you and your guys? <laughs> That's a great question, really. The, um, it's probably not the greatest thing in the world to do, but at the same time, I've been uh, 
an organ builder full time since 1973 and I've done voicing a whole lot of that time and I stick these lead pipes in my mouth all the time. I've had my lead level tested regularly over the years and for the most part it's been going down. There was a, a, a time maybe 15 or so years ago when I had it tested and all of a sudden it had gone up a little bit and I thought I wonder what that's all about and I started thinking about it and that was the time when I started um, flying as a pilot and these old airplanes have low lead fuel in them and I handle that stuff. Uh, we take fuel samples out of the wing sumps to make sure that there's no uh, water in them and you uh, pour that out and you in inevitably spill some on your hands and you get this white residue on your hands and that's lead oxide. So I think the when it started going up was when I started handling aviation fuel and not the organ pipes. The organ pipes have not seemed to be a problem and um, I haven't had it tested recently. I stopped flying about a year and a half ago when I sold my plane and thought I would be going back to it. But then the COVID thing came along about a year ago and so I haven't gotten started back renting or anything else. So I've probably got a pretty good um, basis again to test it because I haven't handled any aviation fuel for at least a year and a half now. So it'd be interesting to see what that does. Um, the guys in the shop are tested too and you could hear when we were doing the casting uh, there at the shop that there was a big exhaust fan running. OSHA has been there and looked at our operation and they're not thrilled with it, but they said that since we only do that a few days a year and, and we're real careful with what we do, it's probably okay. Um, the biggest problem with lead comes when it oxidizes. Um, that tends to happen in the presence of a lot of moisture and or anything that's corrosive. So our atmosphere doesn't seem to do that very much. These pipes get a little bit of a, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, a patina on them that uh, rather quickly that seems to just kind of seal up the stuff and you don't really, uh, you're not exposed to anything uh, too dangerous. The oxide is the dangerous stuff more than the lead itself. And it's also, it seems to be more um, of a problem for uh, young kids than it is for us older people where their brain is still developing. The lead can be uh, absorbed by them and it gets into their brain. Our brains are <laughs> as far as they're gonna go, I guess, at this point. So it doesn't seem to be as much of a problem. The other analogy too is that what we're doing at the organ shop with um, melting the lead and refreezing it is analogous to taking an ice cube at 32 degrees and raising it up to about 34 degrees where it becomes liquid, flattening it out on a sheet and then letting and freezing it again at that point. So just that little bit between um, the solid and becoming a liquid, we're doing the same thing with the lead. Lead doesn't um, gasify until up somewhere around, I don't know, 12 or 1300 degrees and we're casting it at, I don't know, 450 or 500 degrees or something. So we're not getting anywhere close to the point that we're uh, causing a great quantity of it to, to become gasified. But that's a great question that we are very careful with that and try to, uh, to minimize our exposure. But um, I don't know of any cases uh, where organ builders have died of lead poisoning, which is really strange because we probably handle it more than anybody else would. It's an awfully good material and I think it's somewhat maligned in our uh, uh, and uh, I don't know what you'd say, uh, people just think of it worse than it really is, largely because a lot of old lead that's laying around like in batteries and things like that has been exposed to acid. And when that gets out in the air, it oxidizes and old battery centers, you know, car batteries are just covered with lead oxide. And that stuff is really toxic, but we're not handling anything like that. So I think we're a lot better off. <laughs> Good question. Anyone else? Is there a set volume of air flow through those pipes? Uh, sort of. The, the wind pressure of the organ is set by the bellows. Um, there's a regulating valve in there that determines how, how much pressure goes through the organ. Uh, the, the blower can produce, oh, uh, what is it? I think it's um, 80 millimeters of pressure, and that's measured in a, a 
J tube with water in it. You blow in one end and it displaces the water. And uh, 80 millimeters is a little more than three inches of displacement. So we regulate it down here in the organ to 54 millimeters, which is just barely over two inches of pressure. And uh, so the same amount of pressure is being de delivered to each pipe then the volume level of the flue pipes is determined by how wide that windway is, where the air is coming through between the lower lip and the languid. And we can adjust that on all the metal pipes by pulling the lower lip out a little bit or, or pushing it in. So there's not particularly a set amount of air going through, but it is carefully regulated from pipe to pipe so that the volume is the same. If one of them had a lot more air going through than the one next to it, it would be a lot louder than the other one. That's part of the voicing, yeah. Does that help? I keep forgetting to look at the camera and not the computer. So, <laughs> how, do, how does temperature change that? Uh, the, as the temperature goes up, the pitch of the pipe goes up because the molecules of air that are inside the pipe become farther apart. So when they vibrate, there are fewer of them in there and they go at a higher frequency. So. We voice and tune the organ as much as possible at the temperature where the organ's going to be used. And we figure here it's about 70 degrees for that 68 to 70. And the organ was tuned at that. So when we cool off like we have today, when the heat's off in here and it's down to 55, the pitch of the organ is probably, um, it drops about, um, let me think here how that works, half a cycle for, no, one cycle for every two and a half degrees Fahrenheit. So if we're down about 15 degrees in here now, we're down about six cycles from what it was voiced at. So it's probably playing at somewhere around 435 or, or 434 or 5 right now instead of 440 for the A. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Beth would probably like that as a string player. Um, the, the trumpet players are not as happy about it when they have to pull their slides way out to, to get down to the pitch when it cools off. But that doesn't usually happen. When we're having services in here, the organ has had a chance to warm up and it is at uh, the pitch. And, and it can go down in pitch and when it warms back up, it'll come right back up to where it was. So there's, there's nothing to have to readjust. It would be a little bit different if I went in at the low temperature right now and were to retune the reed. The reed is the thing that does, the reed stop doesn't follow quite as well as uh, the, the flue pipes do. So if I retuned it at this temperature and then we warmed it back up, then the reed would be slightly out of tune at the higher temperature again too. So we just leave it alone and only do the tuning on it when it's up at the, uh, the temperature where we're going to use the organ. Another good question. So thanks for uh, joining us this morning. This has been a lot of fun. I hope you learned a few things about the organ and we can do this again in person as soon as we can uh, get back together where we can gather together. I think you'll enjoy hearing it in person a whole lot more. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. That was fabulous, Bruce. Thank you. And Sherry. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks. so much. <laughs>
of the corral, Sherry. Hmm. Really? That's yeah. That's not too surprising. What, what are you on a, a desk desktop or iPad or laptop. laptop? Laptop. Yeah, the speakers on those things don't go down really as low as this Subas plays. This thing yeah. goes down to. No, she has to read. Oh, the read? You yeah. couldn't hear so, the read? So you could just hear dun, da, 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 ba, da, ba, da, ba, da, but not not the bass line. Oh, really. the bass line, yeah. No, she meant the corral. The corral. Yeah. The melody of it? Yeah, because it's, it's in the tenor. That's interesting. It's in the tenor. Well, you, can it's the tenor. you can hear the, 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 the melody line. You just couldn't hear anything that was in the pedal. The oh, pedal. okay. Yeah, 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 I think that's down probably below what your speakers on your uh, computer yeah. can reproduce. If you had a set of external speakers plugged in or something, then you'd hear it better. Well, maybe but, even maybe even headphones. Yeah, that would help too. They, headphones tend to go down lower than the um, than the. Uh, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Yeah. But it was really good. Yeah, great, great presentation, Bruce. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for seeing me, Alan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks for your part. It's just, well, that was fun. It's it's just so it's so complicated. It's just it's an amazingly complicated thing to to have learned how to do all that stuff is like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, people have said that organs in the uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance and even up into the Baroque period were basically the space shuttle of their time. Oh yeah. But they were the most complicated things that humans built up until the uh, advent of the telephone exchange in the 19th century where you had really? all the you know relays and things that were so interrelated. They got more complicated than organs at that point, but uh, but organs were fairly complicated and yet it's a, it's basically a simple machine. It's just well, the concept is simple, but it just has such a uh, so many variants that yeah. you know yeah. Creating a different pitch, for example, that's what, like, woo. <laughs> ah, that's true. <laughs> Good. Uh, that's very cool. Thank you for doing that's that. It's really great. Fascinating. And, you know, it, 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 yeah, you're right. In person would, of course, be better, but it was yeah. still really, really good. We can do something in the meantime. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, how did you get started in all this? Uh, well, that's a good question. Building, building organ building, and well, it's, kind of, it's been in my blood for a long time. I think I was always fascinated by pipe organs. Since I was a little kid. Um, first time I heard one, I was just blown away. And uh, our church didn't have one. We had an electronic organ where I grew up. But uh, one of the sister congregations to my home congregation had a pipe organ, and we went there every so often for services and I was just transfixed by the whole thing so so I learned to play organ um, when I was about 10 or something and studied it in college and uh, basically knew I was more interested in, in uh, building organs than playing them though I'm, I'm nowhere near the organist that Sherry is I, I have to work really really hard at what I do and she can sight read things better than something I've practiced for weeks you know so uh, it became apparent to me pretty early on that my talents were probably elsewhere. And so I had the chance when I was in college to uh, visit an organ shop in southwestern Ohio uh, that was really a um, kind of a granola sort of place at that point in the early 70s. Um, we were a bunch of hippies, you know, doing something that was really uh, countercultural at that point. The organ world at that point had really drifted off very much in the direction of electric playing action and all of that. And we were building these mechanical action things and studying the metallurgy of pipes that were 500 years old and stuff like that. So, so I did an apprenticeship there and, uh, and then kind of got going from that. I had my own organ shop in West Virginia for a few years and we built couple of small organs and a, some harpsichords and some things like that. And then two of the guys that were in that company in Ohio that I worked for um, split off into another company down in Virginia. And uh, so after Sherry and I got married and got out of college uh, and had had our business for a while, um, they started leaning on me to come to work for them. So I uh, closed up my own shop and went to work for them in, in uh, Virginia for 25 years. And then Paul Fritz, who I work for now, I've known most of that time too and we talked a little bit about working together at some point and it just seemed like the time was never right and finally i don't know about 2004 or something i just got a burr under my tail and decided it was time to, to move and so sherry and i came out here to 
to check the place out. And we both got six month leaves of absence from our jobs in case we hated it and decided we wanted to stay in Virginia. So we tried it out and after a couple of weeks, Sherry started looking for houses. And so we, we were gonna do a six month stint here. And after that, we went back and packed up everything and came back and stayed. So now I've been here over 15 years. So, so that's kind of the whole thing. I did two years apprenticeship. I went back to college for two years, um, had my own business for four, 20 in Virginia and then uh, 15 here so it's been quite an interesting career and now I've just recently gone to three-quarter time so I've taken a baby step toward retirement uh, I'm one quarter retired <laughs> Bruce you talked about the uh, organs from the Middle Ages mm -hmm. what what is the oldest organ in Europe that's still working there are a couple of them. There's one in Sion, Switzerland, that they claim is um, the oldest playing organ from 1390. I haven't seen that one. Um, there's some indication that it's a little bit newer than that, but it probably has elements of um, an organ that goes back that far. Sherry and I have played one in Holland that was built in 1440 in Riesum, and uh, it is largely intact um, from 1440, so um, approaching 600 years here, 480 years, I guess, right now. Um, but there are a bunch of them. The, uh, up in the northern part of uh, Holland and Germany, uh, there, it's the highest concentration of uh, historic instruments anywhere in the world. We tend to go there to see old organs and, um, and get inspiration from them because they're also the organs that um, the early ones marked the, the transition from when uh, a lot of those churches, when they were built, were Catholic, of course, and when the Reformation came along, uh, when they had organs, you know, these 1440 organs were built for Catholic churches, and uh, so uh, they weren't particularly built at that point for congregational singing because the Catholics didn't use it for that. They used it to play uh, parts of the Mass on in alternation with the uh, monks singing. And so all these organs represent that transitional point from going from the point where the organ was kind of uh, special music used apart from the human voice to being accompanying the human voice. And that, that kind of happened in North uh, Holland and Germany uh, in, the, in the 17th century. Early 17th century, we have uh, records that uh, the organs were regularly being used in Hamburg, for instance, uh, to accompany the congregation singing. And uh, that happened maybe a little bit later elsewhere, farther up in Germany. I know in Stralsund, we visited an organ that was built in 1659, a big organ. And um, that was not built for congregational singing at that point. It's, it still sounds very much the same as, as the later ones that support the singing, but there is a change. It's more of a, a consort sound and not so much of a, uh, an accompanimental sound, a little bit lighter all over. The scaling is smaller and the voicing's a little bit lighter and everything. So, so there's a big transition period there from the late uh, Middle Ages through the, the Renaissance and into the Baroque and really up to the point of uh, J.S. Bach. J.S. Bach could sit down at our new organ, he would be right at home. The sounds that it makes are, are sounds that he would have known in the organs of his time and it behaves very much like what uh, he would have known too, but and yet at the same time it's possible to play you know all of the modern literature that you want to on it. Um, it's it's a little bit limited in some resources by being as small as it is, but um, but it's remarkable that we can we can play music from uh, so many different centuries on it. So Sherry sure says three minutes to the prelude, so we should probably wrap it up. <laughs> Yeah, great. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, sure thing. Thanks for the questions. Thank you, Bruce. Very yeah, wonderful. Amazing answers. Oh, thank you. <laughs> long, long answer to a short question. <laughs> Have a great day. You too. Thanks.